Our next guest is really going to take it down to a molecular level and train you. So get out your notepads, get out a pen and paper, take out your notes and your phone. He is touring churches and schools and communities, teaching people how to talk about abortion. So I'm really excited for this hands-on training with our next guest, Jay Watts. Give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah. When I agreed to come here, nobody told me I was going to be following Alvita singing. Come on. <laughs> Give me a break. I've been in the green room all morning listening to all the talkers, uh, speakers because I didn't want to repeat anything. And a lot of them have given a lot of inspirational quotes from great political figures, great literary figures. I mean, you've heard a lot of stuff. There's been one glaring omission that I think I intend to fix in a second here. I can't believe nobody's mentioned the movie Free Guy. Um, <laughs> if you've seen it... It's a, it's a fantastic, it's one of my favorite movies. It's like uh, GTA meets Elf, and I'm there for it. I love it, <laughs> right? And, and so there's a point in the movie, if you're not familiar with it, it centers around NPCs, non-player characters, oftentimes designed to be abused. Uh, and in this movie, as they're being abused, they, this one group and this one game begins to develop change. They, they seem to become persons. They become living beings in some way or another that, that demands that the people around them that are playing the games change the way they treat them. And, and free guy literally means the main character's name is Guy by Ryan Reynolds. And at one point in the movie, he's talking to his best friend, Buddy. Uh, and Buddy tells him to keep going, to keep doing what he's doing. And he says this, show them we matter. That is your job. I was given 20 minutes to help you become better at arguing as best I can. Now, that's not a lot of time, and so in light of that, if you walk out that door and across the room, there's a corner over there where there's a table that says reserved. I told them I will stay here all day to answer whatever questions that you have, if you have any specific arguments you want to talk about, any things that you've encountered and arguing on your campuses. I will be sitting over there all day. A word of warning, I have a hostile resting face, and I will be busy working if you're not talking to me, so I will never look like I want you to talk to me. But... <laughs> But if I'm there, or if you see me anywhere, I do. My very presence is an invitation to talk to me. If I didn't want to talk to you, I would be at home with my family. But I'm not, so I'll be right there. So let's talk about how to become better arguers. That's what I do for a living. I argue. I form arguments. I read a lot. I go to places and discuss things. I give presentations. After every presentation, I do a Q&A, because during Q&A, you become a real human being, and you're not just a talking box in front of them. All of this is important to be able to have a conversation with somebody. So I want to help you get better. The first thing I would like to say is we, as we endeavor to show them that the unborn matter, as we make this, 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 this endeavor in our lives to become a voice for the unborn, because unlike every other group throughout American history and world history who has been oppressed, the, un, the unborn are the only group that can't speak for themselves. One of my favorite books growing up uh, was the narrative of Frederick Douglass. And he, he, he tells why he wrote it. He said, people are saying that a former slave couldn't be what I am. They couldn't be as smart as I am. They couldn't articulate themselves. The way. They're accusing him in some way or another of being a fraud. And so he wrote his book so that he could say, this is who I was. This is where I came from. He could be a voice against slavery in the world in which he lived. And this has been repeated all throughout. Gandhi in India being a voice for the Indians under the persecution of the British so he could say, you have a view of me that is less than you. By my voice, I will show you that that's not true. I am every bit the human being that you are. Dr. King took the way that, Mar that Gandhi did in India and adapted it here in the United States. And he said, you believe that the black American is not what you are, is not as valuable as you are, or as smart as you are, is not do all the dignity and rights that every other human being is, but I will show you by my own testimony that you are wrong. And so that is the job that we have, but this time we have a person, a human being, a category of human life that can't speak for themselves. So the responsibility for us to speak up for them is even greater. So, so I want to give you three ground rules to start off. First of all, the only way that you can fail is to not say anything at all. 
You may be afraid to enter into these conversations. You may feel hesitant. You may be worried that they're gonna hate you. Don't worry, they will. You're gonna be worried <laughs> that you're gonna make them angry and you don't want people being angry with you. Don't worry, they are going to get really mad at you. Who cares? We don't need their approval. We don't need them to love us. We don't need them to like us. We don't need them to be happy with what we're saying. We need them to stop killing the unborn. So what you're going to do is you are going to embrace the idea that you are going to fail at first, but you are not going to stop. You're going to get better and better and better. The only way you fail is to say nothing. The other thing I want to tell you, another ground rule for all of this, is I want to tell you to calm down because you're right. And it is, there is no reason for us to get angry and all worked up. We're right. And it is so easy to argue when you're right. People ask all the time, why do you and your friends do so well in debates? So because we're right. Because everything we say makes sense. And the other side has to deal with all the problems and complications that come from being wrong, but I don't. So what you have to do is just calm down because you're right. You don't have to be worried that the truth will come up against you while you're arguing. What you have to do is learn what is necessary for you to learn to defend the unborn, and then have a conversation graciously and peacefully. The other reason it's important for you to calm down is because you need to understand that almost every conversation you have with someone, they're not going to change their mind while you're talking to them. That almost never happens. The truth takes a while to land. I can say that as somebody who used to be an atheist and I used to be pro-choice. The truth just takes a while to land. So you shouldn't talk to people with the expectation that you're gonna win them at that moment. Graciously and respectfully, share what you have to share and when you're done, you move on and let the truth do its own work. Here's the problem though, the truth takes even longer to land if it's shared by a jerk. So, they may decide you were right, but they are never going to admit it because they hate you. So calm down, you're right, be respectful, and let the truth do its own work. We, want to be, we do not want to beat people with arguments. What we want to do is win people with good arguments, and that requires you being a good arguer most of the time. All right, and this is the last thing, the last ground rule before we get into actually arguing. Here's what I want you to get comfortable saying. Abortion is wrong. Abortion is wrong. That's important because most of the people you're gonna talk to, oftentimes, here, I'll tell a quick story. I don't know if I have the time for it, but who cares anyway? So, um, <laughs> I see, like, one of the things you may not know as an audience, even with the lights dimmed, I see most of you. I have pretty good eyes. I can see around the room. Don't let the glasses fool you. And I see when people are sleeping, with, hey, how's it going, man? See, I do see you. You're waving at me. That's right. So, I see all of it, and one of the things that I see very clearly when I'm speaking in places where people disagree with me, I see when somebody in the audience hates me. And you might be surprised to find out I don't care, because I'm gonna be opening up the door, the floor to Q&A when it's all over, and the people who hate me are coming to the mic, and that's helpful for me. And when some, there was one young lady in San Francisco one time, and she hated me more than anybody's ever hated me in my life, and I just loved it. So I was speaking, <laughs> and I keep like making eye contact with her and checking in with her while I'm talking just to keep that hate going, because I need that, I need her energized when she comes to the mic. Uh, and, and so she comes running, to, you know, immediately pops up out of her seat and runs to the mic, and I'm so excited, right? And she gets to the mic, and she says, Mr. Watts, if you don't like abortion, then don't have anything to do with it. But leave it alone for the rest of us. It's like, wow, what a depressing waste of hate. That's the, that's the best you got? So did, did you listen to anything I just said? I never said that I don't like abortion. I said abortion is wrong. And those are two entirely different statements. The world that you live in has a difficult time separating preference claims like I like Reese's peanut butter cups, I like Cherry Garcia ice cream, I like Coke, Pepsi's a vile, disgusting swill. Those are all preference claims. Yeah, and, and save me your Pepsi memes later, I'm not interested. All right, so, but those are all preference claims. I'm telling you something about me. If you love Pepsi, I think you're weird, but you're not wrong. You just have a different preference to me. When I say abortion is wrong, I'm saying it's morally wrong, it's objectively wrong, it's, all wrong. it's wrong for all people, 
at all times, in all places, everywhere. It's a type of injustice that goes in the same category as rape, as child abuse. We don't get to say that it's not a big deal. Some people like child abuse and some people don't. Child abuse is wrong in all cases, every single place. And so is abortion. So that's what we're arguing. So I want you to get comfortable being able to tell people when they say, what is your problem with abortion? You say, abortion is wrong because it unjustly takes the life of an innocent human being. So that gets us to arguing. How do we argue? How many people in this room feel good about your ability to argue? Raise your hand. Yeah, I would expect nothing less in this room than some of you. But let's, we're gonna get more hands up by the end of the day. So here's something that you need to know. It's an old axiom for debate and argument that the person who most successfully frames the debate will win it. That means the person who understands what the debate is about is most likely to be the most productive in arguing their case. And there's a lot of things that are wrong about abortion. And you can walk out this door and see all sorts of things, and that would be expected. If it's a great moral evil, there should be a lot of ancillary wrongs that go with it. But when we talk in a very short amount of time about abortion and we want to make the case that it's wrong, we have to talk about why it's wrong. And it's wrong because it unjustly takes the life of an innocent human being. If none of those other things were true, if every other woman, every woman who had an abortion were happy, if it, served, if it served the community, if it made it more prosperous, if financial gains were seen because of abortion, if nobody had any physical responses to it whatsoever, there were no negative outcomes whatsoever to abortion, and it unjustly took the life of an innocent human being, then it is still wrong, which means that's what we argue, that it unjustly takes the life of an innocent human being. So how do we make that case? We focus in on that question. Is the unborn one of us? Are, what are the unborn? If I could get help, you, sir, right there. Would you help me out for just one second? Right there, right there. You just looked at her, but I'm pointing at you. <laughs> because I said, you, sir, and you looked at a woman, which was weird. <laughs> okay. If, if you could step up just for one second, okay. Would you be willing to do this? Okay, all right, come up, come over. You can jump up, jump up here. Okay, so. I was not prepared for you to be that tall. Okay, um. <laughs> Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you a question. It's what we call a diagnostic question. And this is a way I just wanted to show you how I get going on campuses or I'm talking to people. What I need is a baseline. I need to know how much you and I agree or disagree about how we're approaching just the idea of what human beings are all together, okay? So you ready? Would it be wrong for you and I to kill each other right here? Yes, it would. Yes, it would. That's all I need. Thank you so much. No, seriously, that, thank you, that's it, right? All right. Yeah, yeah, well done. And, and I'm impressed at how quickly you answered. You'd be surprised how many people hesitate because they think it's a trick question or something. It's like, is it wrong for you and I to kill each other? And like, eh, no, 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 yes is the answer, it's wrong. Okay, so almost everybody I've ever asked that question to said yes. There's been two or three that said no. Um, that's important because they don't believe in the existence of objective moral values. They think there's no such thing as right and wrong that governs our relationships. We have no duty or accountability to each other. And when you have somebody like that, it's difficult. You shouldn't keep arguing with them that abortion is wrong. Go talk to them about their worldview. Why? Because they don't think anything's wrong. Not the way that we're talking about. So if you keep hammering that, it's pointless. Now, there is ways to step back and talk to them about that, but we can discuss that if you want to meet me at the table. Uh, so he said yes, though. That means he and I agree about an awful lot of things. We think human beings shouldn't kill each other. Even though you and I are strangers and we've never met, we have duty and accountability to each other that transcends our relationships. And we understand more likely than not, if you talk to somebody, they believe that about the world around them. They'll look at things that are going on in other countries and other nations under different laws, under different belief systems, and they'll say, no human being ought to be treated that way. We have a sense or understanding of universal human dignity, and we share that. So now the next thing I ask people as we're talking about that is, is the unborn one of us then? What do you think the unborn are? If we shouldn't kill each other, that we're allowed to kill them. How do you answer that question? Now, 98% of the people that you talk to have never considered this question at all. They have just assumed all along the unborn are something they're allowed to kill. They're not allowed to do that. There's more to it than this, but there's a test that you can, that you can start to follow in your head. When somebody gives you a reason that abortion ought to remain legal, you can, you can ask yourself, would they make this argument if we were talking about a two-year-old human child? 
Would they make this argument if they were talking about a 10-year-old child? If they were talking about any human being that we both agree is one of us, would they still be saying the same thing? I had a gentleman stand up one time. This is a longer story, but I'll give you a short version of it. I was speaking out in California. This faculty member of the school stands up and he says abortion must remain legal to protect the privacy rights of women. I said, okay. I used a tool that we call Try It Out the Toddler. I said, I agree with you. By the way, I'm an intensely private guy. I'm an introvert. It may seem weird to you that I do this for a living. This is my job. This isn't how I am all the time. I put my hand on my hip and I said, I have a two-year-old little girl standing next to me, sir. Even if I grant with you the importance of privacy, let's imagine this two-year-old little girl is my next door neighbor's daughter and every night in the privacy of their own home, her father viciously abuses her. Would it be okay with you, sir, if we violated the privacy of that family, went into that home and took that child out to protect them from that abuse? And he said, yes, of course. And I said, why? He said, what do you mean why? I said, well, you just said privacy is the reason that we ought to continue to be able to practice abortion. You said privacy is important. You're violating the privacy of this family. He said, it's not the same. And so we went back and forth because I put him on the spot. Why? Why? What's the difference between this two-year-old? Why are we allowed to violate their, the, that family's privacy to go in that house? And finally, he got flustered with me and he said, privacy is not a justification for the abuse of human beings. I said, there we go. All right, all right. All right, now we're getting somewhere, right? Now we're getting somewhere. I agree with you. But you think that the unborn is different from this two-year-old, and I don't, not in morally important ways. So the question is, what is the unborn that they are different from this two-year-old? You have to answer that. You don't just get to plead privacy or poverty or anything else and get off the hook. You have to tell me why, if we can't kill each other, we're allowed to kill them. That's how this works. I'll make my case. You make yours. Now, how do I make this case? In three minutes and 53 seconds is what the timer tells me I have. <laughs> That's fine. You see people online that'll say, science demonstrates that the unborn are human from the moment they come into existence, which by the way is true. They say, science demonstrates that, so abortion is wrong. No. That's not how it works. There are two categories that we're going to have to argue to navigate this argument. One of them is science, because that tells us what they are, that they're Whole, distinct, and living human beings from the moment they come into existence. I could give you a lot more information, but Steve Jacobs did his uh, thesis uh, argument, I think it was at University of Chicago, and when he was getting his PhD thesis, and he sent out questionnaires, heard back from more than 5,000 academic biologists at some of the most prestigious universities in the world, 96% of them affirmed that life for a mammal and human beings begins at conception, at fertilization. As a matter of fact, there is no other point that makes sense to even have the discussion. The biology community has united in a way that is hard to imagine because they even sent him hate mail because they knew exactly what he would do with that information. <laughs> they are united at over 96% saying life begins at fertilization. Science demonstrates it's a whole distinct living human being. So what is the argument then? Woo, I like it too, yeah. It's philosophy. What makes human beings valuable? If we're talking about such a thing as dignity, how do we know when one human life has it and when others? I argue what's called the inclusive view of human value. That means every human being ought to be treated with dignity and respect. I don't have the right to divide the human family up between those people that are human that I think I'm allowed to kill and those that I'm not. I'm not in a position to make that argument. And so we're looking for what explains our shared experience of universal human dignity. And the best explanation for that is the only thing that every human being on the planet shares equally, and that's our shared humanity. If we take that value and try to ground it anywhere else in what Stephen Schwartz, philosopher, calls his sled test, size, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency, if we try to put it on any one of those other things, they're too episodic, they're too changing, they're not universally shared. There's nowhere to land the dignity of human beings anywhere else where it can be universally shared among all other than our shared humanity. The best philosophical approach to human life is to treat all human beings as if they had dignity. As Christopher Kayser said, all throughout human history, we have divided up the human family between those we thought were persons that we had to respect and those that we thought were inhuman or less than us or subhuman, and we could do whatever we want to them. And once we categorize them as something less to, uh, than us, we stole from them, we robbed them, we displaced them, and we murdered them. We enslaved them. And he said, in every single time, we have morally matured to realize that we should have never treated anyone like that. 
Every single time we have divided up the human family into those we must respect and those we don't have to, we have hurt people and then we've matured later and realized that we ought not to have done that. He asked this question, what are the chances that for the first time in human history, we have finally found a category of human life that we are actually justified in abusing and destroying? Or is it more likely that we are wrong again? So when we argue, we want to argue what is the unborn, force them to have that argument with us, force them to have that discussion with us. Remember, the only way to fail is to say nothing. You will be bad at this when you first start doing it. Keep doing it. You will sleep better at night. I am like many people in this room was once on the other side of this. And my change came when I started, I was talking to a, a, one of the fellow speakers on yesterday as we were going from the airport here and we were sharing, we had similar stories. There was a moment that I realized what abortion was. A moment that I realized the number of lives lost. The moment that I realized how we were doing it. The moment I realized how much it was impacting the world around us. In all of my life, as I'd read about great injustices in the world, I had asked myself when I read about Nazi Germany, what would I have been like had I been there? Hopefully I'd have been like Casper Ten Boom. Hopefully I'd have been like those people who are the righteous Gentiles taking care of as best they can their Jewish neighbors. What would I have been like had I been uh, there with the Hutus and the Tutsis during the Rwandan, what I've tried to hide, what I've tried to protect, what I've been a part of those efforts to keep human life safe? What would I have been like here in the United States where I grew up in Georgia and chattel slavery was legal? Would I have been one of the Christians Christians that fought against slavery or would have been like most white Christians and used the Bible to defend slavery. What kind of man would I be if I were there? It's a, it's a question I just kept repeating all through my life. And then all of a sudden, one day I was reading about abortion. And I realized I am right in the middle of something terrible. And I'm not doing anything. And so the first thing I did was start talking. Just start talking to the people around me. Start to say this to everybody that I could get an audience with. Abortion is wrong. Abortion is wrong. And they didn't like to hear it, but it didn't stop me. Abortion is wrong. And they got mad, but that doesn't stop us because abortion is wrong. And they will hate you, but that cannot stop you because abortion is wrong and they can't speak for themselves, which means everybody in this room has a responsibility and duty to speak for them. Thank you all for your time, I appreciate it. <laughs>